Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. This is Stuart Cohen from IGI Cyber Labs. We'll get started in just a second or two. Uh, we're just waiting for people to log in to today's conversation. Uh, we are fortunate enough to have the National Cybersecurity Center with us uh, talking about you know, their observations of some of the things going on in the marketplace, as well as some of the things that they have been missioned and chartered to do. Um, not only to help small businesses, but to help everybody um, around the cybersecurity ecosystem. So we will get to that in a couple of minutes. We're just waiting for people to log in, but thank you very much for attending today's session. So why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, this is in our ongoing thought, uh, cybersecurity thought leadership series, uh, designed to be a public service announcement to help uh, small business leaders, um, whether it's a CEO, a CFO, a COO, a board member, an investor, an angel investor, um, or you know an IT or security person working for one of those small to mid-sized businesses. Um, this is a way to give you a couple of things uh, to be thinking about as it relates to cybersecurity. Uh, with the increase in compliance requirements and the frequency of cyber attacks uh, on the dramatic rise uh, with people working remote in hybrid workforces and all the issues people are facing, you know, our, the Nodeware Advisory Council established this series about a year ago. Uh, we've had about 5,000 people attend these different sessions and watch the YouTube sessions after the fact. Uh, and it's been a great source of, you know, end users getting some information. And then uh, if appropriate, you know, we're happy to provide them a connection with a managed service provider to give them the local assistance and support they need. Uh, to help them be a little bit more safe, be a little bit more secure, uh, maybe keep their critical data away from uh, people that might have access to it, uh, or it might be just about educating employees, or it could be as simple as if God forbid something happens from an attack standpoint, you've done the right things from an availability and system standpoint to be back up and running and running very quickly. Uh, so you can go back to what uh, you were hired to do, which was to run a business, grow a business, support your clients, your customers, and uh, and your shareholders uh, from that standpoint. So today, before we get started, just a couple of things, right? You know, we'd ask you to ask questions. So put them in the chat, put them in the question box. Uh, if you get an opportunity on our LinkedIn, uh, you know, go through, you can ask questions to your peers. We want to be very collaborative. Uh, this is about bringing people together to get to help answer their questions. Uh, to give them insights as to what's going on and to get perspectives. Um, as always, if you have a particular topic or a presenter that you would like to hear from in this series, you know, please let us know. That's quite frankly how we found out about the National Cybersecurity Center. As somebody mentioned to us the, the great work that they are doing. Uh, we reached out to them and we were able to connect and uh, get them on today's session. So uh, let's go to the next slide. We've got some upcoming events that are coming on. Uh, you might have seen we announced a partnership with Gradient. So if you're an MSP or MSSP and uh, you need uh, better billing systems, uh, Gradient's a great solution for you. Uh, we're doing a launch and learn with them on the 28th, talking about how the output from Nodeware integrates into their billing system so you can improve your profitability and more importantly, improve your productivity as it relates to making sure you've got accurate bills going out to your clients and to your constituents. Uh, on the 30th, we'll have our monthly Nodeware Live demo and peer Q&A session. We'll have a couple of users or MSPs on that call uh, to answer any questions you might have. And then uh, coming up on July 21st, uh, we have Bradford Wilkie, 
who literally is uh, just leaving uh, CISA as a for, as a senior advisor. Uh, he'll be on our session talking about some of the U.S. government resources to help small businesses, mid-sized businesses, some of the things they have in the essentials program, and some of the things that CISA, DHS, the Small Business Administration, and others are doing to help small businesses. So those are all on our website. Uh, feel free to go uh, and register for those. As always, uh, if you can't make it, submit any questions in advance and we will get to your questions. We'll get them included in the recording and you can watch uh, the session afterwards on our YouTube channel and get the answers to any of your questions there. Uh, with that, we will move to uh, today's session. Uh, we are, we are fortunate enough to have uh, Mark Weatherford, the Chief Strategy Officer uh, from the National Cybersecurity Center and Forrest Sente, who's the Vice President of Programs and Operations. Um, we'll get right into it. You know, before we get into the National Cybersecurity Center itself, um, you know, you two are, are industry icons. You've got a lot of perspectives of what's going on in the cybersecurity world. You know, maybe Mark, just, you know, give us a little bit of perspective from your standpoint you know, on some of the things that are happening in the world today that might have been different than six months ago or 12 months ago, whether it's COVID, remote workforce, and the like, just a couple of perspectives to kind of kick things off. Well, first off, uh, thanks for having us on, Stuart. And, you know, we really uh, always look for opportunities to promote what we're doing at the National Cybersecurity Center. So really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. You know, it's uh, I get asked this question a lot, and really it's around, you know, what's the state of cybersecurity in the world today? And um, unfortunately, it's, it's not good. I mean, you know, uh, the bad guys are getting badder. Um, regulations are not keeping up. Technology is moving faster than we can ever possibly hope to 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 um, to defend against. So um, so it, it is a challenge right now. Security organizations, both in the public and private sector, are increasingly challenged just to keep pace with with the threat and vulnerability environment. That being said, there's there are some good things happening. We are seeing some technologies today that are um, that are increasingly being able to converge different pieces of security um, and give us better perspectives, better picture, better visibility into that threat and vulnerability environment. You know, I think we still need to, you know, we can never let our guard down against, you know, things like, like ransomware and DDoS, um, you know, supply chain uh, threats and vulnerabilities have become du jour. You know, they literally, we are seeing companies build their entire security strategy around how to defend against um, supply chain attacks. And, you know, I, I think historically, I still talk, I talk to a lot of people about this these days, and people still historically think about supply chain from a, from a standard kind of logistics perspective. How do I get a product from point A to point B? You know, whether it's on a ship or an airplane or a train or a truck or whatever it might be. But, in our world, obviously, supply chain means something completely different. We're worried about the the um, where products are being developed, um, what is being going into those products, how are we monitoring what's going into these products, and by these products, I mean technology, software, and hardware. This is why um, the the Software Bill of Materials Initiative has gotten such great traction over the past year and uh, over the past couple of years. In fact. You know, we were really um, surprised and excited that it was such a big part of uh, President Biden's executive order in May of last year, um, May of 2021, that Software Bill of Materials was a huge piece of that. So we see companies now that are saying, wait a minute, I'm not going to buy technology anymore unless you give me the recipe, unless you give me the menu that says, here's everything that's included in this. Um, because that then gives them the ability to say, okay, we, we understand the risk that we are um, accepting by buying this product. Every product has vulnerabilities, we know that. There's, it's just impossible to avoid that. But if I know what I'm, what I'm buying, then I can mitigate against those vulnerabilities very, very easily and knowingly. So that's a long way to answer your question, but you know, I think 
the the challenges in the in the business are are as great as they've ever been um but we have things happening that are able to mitigate those to a certain degree and one of the other things i i guess i would be remiss without saying is that the federal government has really stepped up to the plate over the past couple of years we see many more um, activities at the federal government, much more funding coming through from the federal government to organizations, state and local government organizations to help them. We see more regulation. I mean, I, I was just reading this morning, the National Defense Authorization Act for 2023 includes a whole swath of new um, initiatives around cybersecurity that's going to be in the NDAA. So these are, I mean, I could... <laughs> I can remember when I was a CISO for the state of California, I was on my hands and knees begging to get Governor Schwarzenegger to just mention cybersecurity in the State of the Union address and now, or the State of the State address. And now, you know, it's become, become you know, commonplace. Everybody is talking about it. So we're making great progress, um, but don't take your foot off the gas. Or if anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, Mark's perspective on all this stuff is always valued given his experience. So I, I, you know, I think the biggest thing I heard and what Mark said that I would add, add on to is um, specifically on the supply chain piece. I feel like, you know, especially over the past six to 18 months, I mean, starting with SolarWinds, making that a big national kind of attention piece and understanding what your risk is for supply chain. Um, I think the biggest thing I know now is, you know, I spent, I spent a few hours last week with a few kind of younger startup companies talking about intellectual property, understanding risk, you know, what does it look like to kind of manage your supply chain? What do things like cyber insurance mean? Like at an early stage for a company. And I, and I sit here and I think, you know, especially in the last six months, um, I feel bad for some of these companies having to go and raise money and now having to include on that cap table, um, you know, how much are they going to invest in cybersecurity as a young company? Uh, and I think that's one piece that I think people kind of overlook is this idea of you want to bring that product to market, but it balancing at the same time, this idea of making sure that intellectual property and that those initial customers are defended because you know that risk of losing um you know your credibility as an early company is it's paramount um so i think when i'm looking at the market right now i think the biggest things for me is i'm just sitting here evaluating risk and understanding what that risk looks like and i think in the context for insurance companies right now um i mean premiums are going through the roof i mean last year was the largest payouts we ever saw from cyber insurance and we'll probably continue to see that trend increase over the years um, and those insurance companies are trying to make sure they don't, you know, lose their shirt again, right? So they're going to be finding different ways and encouraging, especially like the S&B market we're talking about here. I mean, those people are going to be the ones where they say, are you mandating 2FA? You know, how are you evaluating your supply chain security? What, what vendor questionnaires are you using? How are you doing these things? Um, and that risk is just going to get passed down further and further and further into all these different aspects. So it's interesting to me to sit here and watch the market. Um, and the government is is quickly becoming a leader and a driver in a lot of this, especially starting with CMMC and that whole movement, you know, a few years ago. But it's good to see it all coming together. But yeah, to Mark's point, can't take the foot off the gas. So we're we're just now hey, Stuart, at a place. Really interesting. Stuart, I want to follow up a little bit on, on yeah, on what um, what Forrest was saying about cyber insurance, and just give a plug. Um, the Center for Digital Government just released a paper yesterday. Um, and I was fortunate enough to get to be able to um, comment on it in pre-production um, on cyber insurance. And I thought it was a phenomenal paper. I, I think it's a phenomenal paper. I'll share that with you and then you can share it with, I don't have it handy right now, I'd, I'd put it up here, but um, really, I, I think it's one of the best things I've seen because it puts everything in one very short paper that small, medium-sized businesses state and local governments need to be thinking about. And one of them, by the way, is that that we 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 hear about it all the time now. People are wondering, can I even get cyber insurance now? Um, you know, the bar is raising up so high that there's gonna be a lot of people excluded because they don't have the right security controls in place to be able to qualify for insurance. And even if they do qualify to get cyber insurance, the premiums are going up where they may I, I here's my prediction. I think we're going to see over the next year or so, people are going to say, I am going to self-insure myself by, it, it, I, since I can't get cybersecurity insurance or it's too expensive, I'm going to take the money that I was investing in insurance and I'm going to invest it in security. 
and, and use that direct investment to drive my risk down. That's Weatherford's prediction. But I'll share that paper with you, and then you know you can uh, you can share it out with your audience. No, that would be great. We'll uh, we'll obviously distribute it to all the people that are registered. We'll include it uh, as an attachment uh, when we send them a follow on thank you note for attending today's session, uh, and we can post it up on our website as well for anybody that wants to get a copy of it. So thanks for sharing that. You know, it, it's interesting. You know, you talk about how things have changed. You know. When I joined IGI Cyber Labs a year ago, when we launched the subsidiary and separated Nodeware from the services business and the consulting business, you know, I thought that Nodeware would go to people that had never run a vulnerability management scan, um, that, you know, didn't have a connection with an MSP or MSSP, probably were just getting started in multi-factor authentication, educating their employees, you know, getting started on the path to cyber hygiene. But it's amazing with all of the, the compliance requirements and all of the frequency of cyber attacks, we now have people that, you know, use the traditional vulnerability management uh, product um, and they did a scan once a month or once a quarter or annually or maybe Sunday nights when nobody was on the system. And now that's no longer acceptable. Now, to your point, the suppliers, the supply chain, the customers, the clients um, are saying, if you're going to have my critical data in your ecosystem as part of it, you need to be doing continuous mm -hmm. scanning on a normal business hour daily basis. And it doesn't make any difference whether the people are working at home or whether the people are in the office. You need to make sure that my data is going to be safe and secure. And it's created an environment where, you know, we're now providing agents and sensors on corporate issued devices that people are using at home. And the employers are asking, you know, I want to make sure everything on your home Wi-Fi is not getting into that corporate device, which might be getting into our critical data that, oh, by the way, you might not even be aware of is on your home Wi-Fi. Or if you're living in an urban environment, you know, it may be in another building nearby. So. It's yep. amazing how the market has changed with the frequency of attacks and the requirements on companies to, you know, report and support where they are on the compliance evolution. You know, I remember saying this five or six years ago um, in, in a talk or in, in multiple talks, I used to say things like, be careful, you know, right now we find it hard to get attention within our organization for security. The day is going to come when we're going to have more attention than, what, than we know what to do with. And, you know, without a doubt, the day has arrived. I mean, you know, and, and as part of my consulting business, I work with probably a dozen companies right now and with CISOs who are trying to figure out how do they answer their board's questions. You know, the board, boards are very savvy about risk. They may not, you know, they understand, um, they understand geography risk, they understand, uh, you know, market risk, they understand regulatory risk. Um, they understand all these, they don't understand cybersecurity risk, and they're trying to figure out how do we take this cyber risk and bring it into our, our um, overall corporate risk, uh, risk environment. So, CISOs are really struggling today to figure out how to have that conversation because board members are, you know, they know they don't know, but man, they're asking a lot of questions. Well, you know, a year ago, uh, we saw surveys that said 50% of the small businesses in the United States, 20 employees to 500 employees, thought that the bad guys would never find them. Right. So huh. they didn't really have to worry about it because 50 percent of them thought they'd never find them. You know, we now see numbers where now there's, you know, five percent and 10 percent of the people think that the bad guys will never find them. So it's amazing how in a 12 month shift, you know, such a substantial portion of that segment of the market has just kind of changed their thinking on where they are. But before we get to the national cyber I was going to I was going to comment on that, you know. Yeah. I can remember having this conversation about security by obscurity, you know, 15 or 20 years ago. It didn't work then, and I guarantee you it doesn't work today. Sure. So we got 
we have kind of a big business question, but since you mentioned your consulting firm and you talked about boards, we got a question specifically about the cybersecurity committees that are starting to be formed in organizations with different, you know, different folks from the chief privacy officer to the chief risk officer, the CIO, the CISO, the general counsel, and head of HR and the like. Um, we got a question that said, you know, what are the advantages of signing the CISO as the chairman of the cybersecurity committee? Um, and is that becoming common in the industry? And I'm just curious of your perspective on that before we move on to uh, the National Cybersecurity Center and your mission and vision goals and objectives. So I wouldn't say it's not common yet, but there are, uh, CISOs are definitely being brought into the risk conversation more often. In fact, I was just talking with a friend yesterday. He's, he's a CISO at a global company. They have operating, uh, operating units and, and, um, and subsidiary companies around the globe. He has seven risk committees that he reports to um, uh, and you know, in different countries. So he's got to understand the, the risk environment, the regulatory environment, the threat environment in all these different places. So um, the, I think the role of the chief information security officer is evolving and uh, maybe this is kind of where you're going. I think there's there's going to be a, a melding or a blending or a convergence at some point, and not in every company, but certainly in the Fortune 500, the Fortune 1000, where people are going to say, you know, wait a minute, why do we have a separate um, uh, risk organization um, and a separate security organization when really they're doing the same thing, and in, in not completely, but in many respects. So. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely having an impact, definitely, definitely having an impact. Yeah, I was going to say, I, you know, I keep in touch with probably 50 of the, you know, I don't know, Fortune 200 CISOs that I know from a global standpoint from my, you know, from a past life. And uh, almost none of them chair the cybersecurity committee at their organizations. They're all on it or they all report to it or they all take yeah. actions coming out of it but they don't tend to chair it because I think they're trying, the organizations are trying to get somebody with a broader business profile exactly. to chair it. So uh, it's just interesting that the person asked about the advantages of the CISO chairing it. I don't see that happening very often. No, there's, and again, security is just one risk that a corporate faces, a corporation faces. You know, there, there's a whole lot, the whole, business risk, financial risk, regulatory risk that's unrelated to cybersecurity. So I agree. I think, you know, cyber is going to continue to be a part of it, but it it, it doesn't make sense in my mind for, for the CISO to be running it. Now, one other thing that's happening, and, you know, we've seen this discussed for several years now where um, boards are beginning to actually bring cybersecurity advisors onto the board. They're not members of the board in, in, in many cases. Some cases they are, but they're actually hiring, uh, they're actually bringing board of directors, uh, members on that have a cybersecurity background. But I think what's happening more often is they're bringing consultants in or advisors in that can advise the board um, as they start seeing some of these cybersecurity related issues pop up. In fact, you may remember uh, two or three years, two years ago, I think, there was a piece of legislation at the federal level that said that um, that they wanted to require boards to have cybersecurity expertise available to the board. They didn't really qualify or qualify what that meant, um, but I, it's not going to go away. It's it's definitely a trend that we're going to continue to see grow. So let's move on for a second. You guys are doing some innovative things at the National Cybersecurity Center the mission, the vision, you know, some of the things that Colorado was looking for, some of the things you're doing nationwide. You know, if you could elaborate a little bit on that uh, and then, you know, the impact that it's having and the things that you're doing, you know, specifically for small and medium businesses, but certainly you guys are touching the broader cyber ecosystem as well. So you could maybe elaborate a little bit on that. Forrest, do you wanna go first? Yeah, sure, I can jump in, that's fine. Um, so I think the biggest thing for us, I guess, in terms of our background and kind of where we came from, 
So for context of that organization, we were founded in 2016, but we didn't really become operational until uh, about you know fall to early 2018. So we're kind of in our fourth year of operation here in terms of building up and, and getting on our feet. But one of the big things we've always been really focused on is you know building this kind of collaborative operational and interdisciplinary model for cybersecurity that was modeled after um, kind of a lot of the work that Israel does in this area, specific to kind of how they intersect government, industry, academia, the military sector, all these different places coming together all around this bigger idea of solving cyber threats. Um, and so when the NCC has been involved in this thing, a lot of the ways that we talk as staff and as a team, is this idea that we're a think and do tank versus kind of a traditional think tank. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the work and the outputs that we do um, typically come from larger problem sets that are addressing society. Um, or in some cases are specific to Colorado, like we do with one of our programs, the Colorado Cyber Resource Center. Um, but ultimately, everything we do feeds back to kind of three core kind of pillars, this idea of lead, collaborate, educate. Um, you know, education being our fundamental piece. It's been our oldest thing. It's what we really started for. Our workforce was, has been and will continue to be the single biggest problem in cybersecurity for the future of where we're trying to go. Because we can talk about all these big problems happening in cyber, but if we don't have an expert sitting there behind the keyboard fixing these things, you know, it's all for naught, right? Um, but I think that's one big piece on the collaboration piece. Um, one of the big areas we've really been focused on is space as well. Um, you know, given our community here, we have, you know, Peterson Space Force Base, Shriver, all these different areas, Space Commands here, Space Force, all that kind of stuff. We have a natural geographic Kind of location where we focus on space and so a lot of the small businesses um, and really large businesses uh, that we work with are, are around the space industry or, or are in some cases subcontractors so that's kind of one of our big places there we really focus on kind of the collaboration in the space industry uh, really globally um, and a lot of that work really comes down to threat sharing so if you're if everybody here is familiar with ISACs we run the space information sharing and analysis center a lot of that effort kind of flows through that um, and then on the lead side, I mean, Mark and I both are on our cyber committee. Our cyber committee is a little different um, than maybe a corporate cyber committee. It's really about thought leadership and education and kind of keeping an eye on the future. Um, I'll plug, you know, like an example of some of the things we've done is that committee produced a zero trust paper. So one of our board members, Rick Crandall, will be on here. I don't know the exact date, Stuart, but um, talking about that. But that's an example of an output that we do there. Um, but that's, that's really a lot of our work. I don't know if Mark, there's anything else you want to add there from, from your purview, but. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, maybe from a historical perspective, as you said, you know, um, this, this whole, the, the, the NCC National Cybersecurity Center is very, very um, strategically selected national to be in the title of the organization. You know, when um, Governor Hickenlooper, then Governor Hickenlooper, now Senator Hickenlooper, uh, was governor in 2015. He traveled, as Forrest said, traveled to Israel, and he saw what Israel was doing around um, collaboration at the national level and down to the grassroots level. And he goes, my goodness, we're not doing anything like that in the United States. He came back and he said, we're going to start this as a Colorado initiative, but we named it the National Cybersecurity Center because we think it can grow into something much much greater than that so you know as Forrest said it, you know our, our the three pillars of our organization are lead collaborate and educate and we began immediately um the, the the longest running operational piece of that is the education and it's i i think it to me it's like it's one of the shining successful stars of our organization that we have trained thousands of people to date um, uh, when I say uh, and people, we have we have K through 12 education, we have uh, adult education, we have summer boot camps, we have um, CSFs, we have all of these different programs that we're running and uh, uh, out of the NCC where where um, and we even now we have relationships with other states where we're combining some of that training and able to educate people in, in other states. So it's definitely, I think, the, the highlight of the NCC today. But when you look at our, um, our board of directors, oh my gosh, you know, it, it, we have a board of directors of, of national luminaries that r literally it's, 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 it's the best in the world. I mean, the people that we have on our board come from all across 
government and the private sector, all kinds of experiences from, from you know, Fortune 500 CEOs down to, um, to startup CEOs. Um, and that, um, that, that expertise allows us to generate thought leadership and, and you know, community involvement. As Forrest said, you know, we wrote a paper on, on zero trust that really came out of the board of directors. Um, one of our board of directors was an uh, initiative. He said, we think this is important. And then the other thing I, I can't even say is not a big enough word to say how important the space ISAC is, um, not for the nation, but the fact that we were chosen as the executive director of the space ISAC is really a big deal. I mean, and it's a vote of confidence for this organization, you know, that we were going to be able to, um, to lead out on that. And if you, if you look at the space ISAC's website thing, you see all of the, you know, the companies involved with space that are members and actively sharing information on a daily basis. It's really pretty darn profound um, that we have been able to do this in really a pretty short period of time for for a really small nonprofit. I mean, I don't know, I don't know what our headcount is today as far as staff members, but I think it's probably less than 25 people, and we're doing all of this um, and having a real national level impact. I mean, Forrest didn't toot his own horn enough, but you know, he works daily with legislators at the state legislators and their staffs at the state and at the federal level to see, you know, how the NCC can be um, an advocate for what these government organizations are doing. So, and, and you know, we talked about it earlier, we don't charge for what we do. I mean, we're a nonprofit. So our job is, is, is benevolence to a large degree um, to work with um, small and medium-sized businesses and state and local governments on cybersecurity around the country. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. maybe we did get a question that I think uh, leads to some of the things you were just talking about. You know, they talk about, the question was around, it seems like cybersecurity needs to be handled primarily at the national level. And, you know, how do you share intelligence globally when there are nation states driving you know, the cyber threats used both militarily and commercially. Um, you might want to talk a little bit about kind of the infrastructure for how that sharing works. And then, you know, locally, how is, uh, you know, how is that brought down at a local level to maybe some of the managed service providers and vendors that help support small businesses? Sure. So I can speak to that in two pieces. Um, one on the first part in terms of like the cybersecurity piece of, you know, is this actually at a, at a national level, federal, et cetera, however you want to describe it. My big thing when we started this entire project between the space ISAC, the work that Mark was, was referencing, and thank you for the compliment, um, you know, is this idea of one of the big things we really drilled down, and this isn't something that's in our mission and vision, it's just something how we talk internally, is that it's a whole of society approach. Cybersecurity is without a doubt a whole of society approach. The big pieces that we always focus on are always that training and that education portion of the workforce, making sure that the average person knows like a baseline of cyber so that they can protect themselves. So when we talk about that this is a national issue, yeah, of course it's a national issue, but it's also a state issue, it's a local issue, it's the post office's issue, it's everybody's issue. Um, so I think the greatest thing and the benefit, I know you have uh, um, the senior, former senior advisor from CISA coming on. I mean, he'll be the first one to tell you that you know, this is a multi-layered piece and then everybody has their part and it's technical, it's non-technical, it's an intersection of all of it. Um, so that's one part and I think that's really important and that's something we really talk about we focus on our programming. The second piece when it comes to the Space ISAC, um, one of the beauty, the, the, the beautiful things with the Space ISAC really is we've been able to build these incredible federal relationships where we can get data feeds that are unclassified quickly and rapidly to all the members and they get the threat information first. You know, they have, a, if you're familiar with anything with the military, or you know, it's a typical kind of, um, oh man, it's the orange, the, what's the, uh, T oh, TLP, the TLP system, you know, you get all the different things that come through, it lets you know how all the different stuff is, you know, letting, you know, the alerts and all these different things. One of the big things of being a member for us is um, every single morning there's a daily threat briefing of, of different kind of uh, different known vulnerabilities, all the different things you should be looking at. 
But in terms of the way that that feed and that information gets passed down to um, kind of the local level, like an MSP as an example, is whenever that threat information gets shared back towards from the private sector towards the government, as long as that threat information affects a larger breadth of people, typically the, the government has a responsibility to take that information and share it out through their networks. So if you're not already collecting data feeds from, because um, you know, like the FBI, CISA, DHS, all of those have unclassed data feeds that the average person can go tap into, like in their, you know, like in their SIM, for example, um, you can go get that information right now. It's just a matter of going and finding it. Um, but yeah, Mark, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add on there. Yeah, no, only one thing, and I, but I want to. Um, you know, w one of the things that we've seen, and I, I, I think I'm going to kind of transition off what you just said for us. One of the things that we've seen over the past couple of decades, you know, and, and just to show you how long I've been doing this stuff is, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, 20 years ago, the threats that, that, that small and medium sized businesses, actually the threats that anybody faces today in the, in the information security business were really nation state threats that our government was responsible for. You know, we would have never in a million years, 15 years ago said, hey, you know, Joe's coffee shop, you need to worry about China attacking you. Or you need to worry about Russia attacking you. That was the realm of the federal government, you know? And if that would have happened, you know, the FBI or, you know, some other government agency would have jumped right in to be a part of that. Today, you know, it doesn't matter what size your organization is kind of go to what you said earlier, Stuart, you know, about companies said, I never thought that it would be a problem for me. It's a problem for everybody now. And, and this is the, this is the challenge. And I think this is where the NCC has the biggest impact and value to, to smaller organizations is these organizations don't have the resources of a fortune 500, but yet they face the same threats as a fortune 500. So we're able to help them educate them. Um, you know, we get, you, you wouldn't even believe the kind of, of questions that we get from small and medium sized businesses, state and local governments about the kind of help they need, you know, that we can help them with. And so forth. So I want to pitch it back over to you. The, the program that you ran last year on educating state leaders, can you talk about, I, I think that was like a shining example of what the NCC can do. Sure. Yeah. No, thank you, Mark. Um, well, first, I mean, the, the project wasn't able to get off the ground without support from Google. So I got to I got to always give them a shout out and thankful to their team for, for supporting us with that grant. Um, but I guess the pinnacle piece of the program. So a lot of the work that we did for cyber for state leaders was really centered on this idea of, you know, you know, a rising tide raises all shifts. Um, when we have a nation where a vast majority of our legislators have little to no, uh, you know, technology knowledge, let alone cyber knowledge, uh, you know, at their core, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there was, there was a big opportunity there to kind of work with legislators hand in hand and give them a baseline of education so they understood what cybersecurity is and how it affects their state and their constituents. Um, so what we did last year was we built this program where we went to all 50 states and U.S. territories. And we built a core curriculum. Uh, we built kind of a coalition of, of, you know, Fortune 500, really Fortune 50 companies that contributed time, their experts, all that kind of stuff to produce uh, a series of, you know, essentially cyber hygiene, but they elevated really nice quality cyber hygiene videos where we paired kind of concepts like, you know, MFA with what does a CISO do in your state with how do you, how do you build relationships and understand fundamentals of cyber policy um, we built this program, we went to all different states, you know, we were able to hit a little under 20% of the nation's legislators over last year. Um, and the nice thing as an output for that program was we really went into all these different states where CISOs maybe hadn't, have a, a, hadn't had a strong relationship with, say, the governor's office or secretary of state or even the legislature as a whole. And we were able to build these relationships in all these states so that the CISO for the state, like in Mark's previous role in Colorado and California, was they able to have more of a consultative role when evaluating new policies or looking at new spending and all those kinds of things? Because in the past, it was a one-way direction. They'd already made the decision, hey, what do you think of this? Versus what do you need? What does the state actually do? You know, what, what are the things that would make a, like a logical incremental difference in the state's security posture? Um, and those are some of the things you're able to affect. And it was really interesting to see that happen. Um, but one of the cool outputs of it and one of the things that we kind of did as part of the grant process was all of that training that we built um, for those legislatures, which was at a very high level. I mean, we had Microsoft and Comcast and Google and all these different great companies volunteering time. Um, all that all that cyber hygiene 
training is free and available online for everybody. I mean, we've got worksheets, we've got, you know, it's, it's you know, roughly about an hour worth of modules that you could use. You could take one of them and, and use them for a quarterly training session on your team on like fishing as an example, but it's all like super high quality and it's really educational and interesting. And Mark did a great job of, of um, which one did you do, Mark? I can't remember, it wasn't fishing, it was something like that. Um, but, I don't uh, remember either. I'll have to go watch the video to remember. Um, but that was a while ago. But uh, point being, you know, part of the reason why we made that all free and available to the public was we actually do send them out to SMBs who want them. It's online. You can just go grab it. If you're trying to build a cyber hygiene training program for your staff, go grab the videos. You know, go use them. Um, and that's one thing that was a big out. So to that point, you know, if I put you guys on the other side of the table and you go to work for a small business that maybe has no IT or no security person or just somebody who does desktop support, but nothing else. You know, what are the first few steps? You know, if you get brought on board that organization, what are the first few steps you do to help kind of take them to what I refer to as kind of the first level of cyber hygiene? One of our advisory councils, Alan Alford, who went from NTT as a global CISO to TrustMap, a small wow. business, you know, he talked about the three legs of the stool, right? Multi factor, vulnerability management, and, uh, and employee education is kind of the three things that you need to do to get started. I'm curious from your perspective if you go to a small business and they have an IT person doing desktop support, what do you do to get started? And what do you do? And then maybe to your point, how do you interject those videos into that? Sure. Yeah, I can I can start, Mark, if you want. Um, yep. I know the biggest thing. I think those three things that you just mentioned are really powerful and they're they're important to do. Um, there's a fourth one that I would add to that list, and I think it's you know it's understanding your devices. Um, you know, how many devices do you have? What kind of things are you doing on them? You know, who are your key, kind of your key components of those pieces? Um, and when I say devices, I mean that includes the network too. Um, even if it's not trying to build this incredible, you know, adding in a firewall, like a UTM firewall kind of system or doing all these different things, I think if people just take the time to sit there and understand what devices are, they're using, um, how they're being configured, the way they're being set up, the number that they have, understanding their endpoints, all that kind of stuff, just having a list of them and writing them down. Um, and then once they finish the device piece, then kind of moving on to the software, understanding which software they're using. Um, you know, all those other things you said between MFA, vulnerability management. Um, what was the third one you said again? Employee education. Oh yeah, and then the employee education, like all of those begin to blend together if you understand your devices and your network overall. Uh, and that employee education piece, I mean, if you were to use the videos that we have, I mean, at different points in the onboarding process, one of the things I tell everybody is when you onboard, set a massive baseline and spend a lot of time, and then you can kind of update it as you go along. They got the education up front. But on the MFA piece, I mean, we've got a great video talking about MFA and why it's so important. On the vulnerability management piece, um, we actually have the former CISO for Colorado, um, but not Mark. Uh, oh, me? Play, but <laughs> we had two former CISOs. Uh, you know, you know that she talks a lot about this idea of like how does patch management work, why it's so important, how do you do that? Um, yeah, you know, there's anything else you want to add there, Mark? Yeah, I, I, I would say, you know, I still think um, education is the one thing at our disposal that's the easiest for us to do and can have the biggest impact, but gets the least amount of attention. Um, and it's it's unfortunate. And yeah, I, I, honestly, I don't have a good answer for it because I've been trying to crack that nut for 20 years. But um, but it really is kind of the key when you go into these small organizations um, that don't have any resources, or as you said, you know, they may have one person that's performing multiple functions, um, security being one of the hats they wear. Um, the the only way that you can get the kind of resources you need is through education, through educating the leadership of the organizations uh, about the threats and about the risks that their organization is exposed to. So, and, and again, I think that's why it's one of our pillars. Education um, is one of the NCC's pillars because as we can talk to small and medium-sized business leaders and, and, and you know some local government folks, 
it's it's the one thing that we can do and we may be may not be able to help them directly but you know collaboration is again it's one of the key pieces of, of our organization we can help them by helping introduce them to other people that they can collaborate with um yeah a, a couple of a couple of things that very are, are near and dear to me is really around some of the critical infrastructure pieces that local governments are responsible for you know electricity and water being being the most important i mean you go into a lot of these small um small uh government organizations where they have a a local co-op or a local local municipal authority for water water is one of those critical resources that we don't think about often enough and and yet you know, it's not getting any of the kind, any of the resources that it needs to get for the most case. You know, we've seen a number of events just over the past two or three years where these local water authorities were either breached or potentially breached um, or got some, definitely got some unwanted attention. Um, and I wanted to go back, of course, you, you, you may not even know it, but you made a, a wonderful point about understanding your assets. You know, under, as long as I've been in security, and you know, I know it's a cliche, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you don't know what your assets are, you cannot protect them. Um, that's why it's the number one uh, in the CIS top 20. Understand your assets. Um, and, and oftentimes, people need external support to do that. And I think to go back to your to your original kind of, of line of thought there, Stuart, I you know I I have I've changed my mindset over the years. You know when I was a CISO, I wanted to own my infrastructure. I wanted to own the people. I wanted to own everything about security. But I really have come to a a change of heart on this, where it's much more efficient. It's much more. Um, cost effective to outsource some of this stuff you know why as on the small uh, small organization if i can only hire one or two people that's not enough to cover the landscape of all of the security threats and vulnerabilities so that's where i think mssps and msps come into play because they do have that infrastructure already they do have the well-trained people that they have to keep trained um, in order to keep their customers so it's so much easier to outsource the majority of security if you're a small organization to another company that's actually an expert in it why try to build that expertise on your own um, and, and 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 not just outsource it out one of the other things and, and i have this conversation a lot with local governments it's like okay there's grant money to go buy um, new technology new security technology well, that's great for this year. What about next year when you've got to resource that? You've got to train your people. You've got to upgrade. You've got, you know, that's why, you know, a tail to owning infrastructure. And most people don't factor that resource and support tail into their initial thinking. Again, that's why I, I'm a huge fan of, of outsourcing to MSSPs where it makes sense. You know, it's it's funny that you say that. You know, I when I meet with our MSP and our MSSP partners, and they always say, "Well, how do I start the conversation with my current IT clients that I want to transition, or I need to help them get to cyber hygiene?" And I always tell, ask them two questions: Do they know what devices on their network are potentially vulnerable that have access to critical data, and do they care? And then do they know when a new device shows up on their network that could have access to critical data and do they care? And if the answer is no to both of those, let them go, right? But if the answer is yes to either one of those, it's now the quickest time for you to be able to qualify them on what's really on their mind, what keeps them up at night, what are they concerned about? And then you can start to have an effective conversation with them. So I always go back to, it's the two simple questions. And that and and everything starts from there. And if they still, you know, if they're saying I'm not so concerned about either one of those, they're now in that 10%, and come back to them in six months because you know they're probably going to see something or hear something. When they've had a data breach, yeah, yeah, that's going to make them think about that. Um, you know, while we don't uh, 
we got a question specifically about, uh, you know, is there a way to create some sort of, you know, benevolent ISAC that goes beyond CISA that does alerting and warnings to anybody that are willing to turn in, right? Kind of like the U.S. alert system, but on a broader basis. Um, no membership that's required, just a public sharing, threat info, crowdsourcing analysis is is there a better way we can kind of level the playing field for you know not just the people not just the fortune 2000 that have the resources to collaborate um well is it possible yes but it still costs money to do that you know right. um it, you know it, it has to be funded by some somebody yeah. um even even if you're giving your services away you have to have you, you you have to have you know the resources to build that that infrastructure now and there are up, right yeah yeah exactly again remember the resource sale it's it's one thing to build it it's the next thing to resource it and and maintain it um but you know what what it's it, at least at the local government level you know what i always encourage people to do is Call your state CISO office. You know, no state CISO is going to turn you away. They're not going to say no. I, I can't talk to you. You know, they they may point you in a different direction, but it's a resource that that local governments have, and and it's the same way with um, with with small and medium sized businesses. There are a number of ISACs out there that you know they may. You know that they, they may not embrace you as a full member, but they're going to provide some resources or some guidance or some direction. Mark, small your audio is back. It's back now. Oh. You're good. Okay, my headphones just died, so I'm on my speaker now. Sorry about <laughs> that. So, but call the NCC. You know, we can help. We can provide guidance. We can. You know, we may be able to provide guidance to resources. Um, you know, that's where, you know, Forrest does, does his magic. You know, he knows everybody um, in, in state, local and federal federal uh, security who um, who may have those kind of resources. So, you know, call us, you know, we'll figure out a way to help you. We are never going to say no, we can't do anything for you. Well, you know, it's yeah. it, it's funny that you say that. So. Like I said, 12 months ago, you know, we had Bradford Wilkie on from CISA as a senior advisor uh, to Jen. And, you know, at the time, you know, he was talking about in their cyber essentials program, they provide a free monthly scan for any small business that wants to get a monthly scan of their vulnerability management. And unironically, you know, he said that on one of these webinars and a whole bunch of people took them up on that in the next 60 days. And then ironically, most of them came to us and said, it was great that we got that snapshot, but I can't tell my boss that every 29 days we get this updated. That doesn't work very well for me. And it led to, you know, can I get, you know, normal business hour scanning, you know, for well under a dollar a device per month to be able to find out what's vulnerable and to get an alert on what's on my system. So it just, it was interesting how their program was great at providing it for free, but it was almost at a rate and pace that wasn't consistent with the attackers. Yeah, and, and to go back to your, to your to the question you just got, one of the other, I think one of the other resources, since you mentioned CISA, CISA has a cybersecurity advisor program where they have people in regions around the country anybody can call them and they will come in they'll do an assessment they'll they'll help them just kind of give you a snapshot of what the pictures what your security landscape looks like and then help you to say okay what's next do you you know is there a, a an mssp that you can go that will satisfy your needs are there education that the ncc or the CISA can provide that will help to bring your your staff and, and executives up to speed um, I think the CISA program, and you know, quite candid, it 
it, it was something we started when I was at DHS, and it's one of the one of the two programs that I'm really happy it continues to today. You know, because a lot of times, and when you start these programs, you leave and then they fall off. But this thing is is it's actually it's it's grown. It's probably 10x what it was when we started it when I was at DHS. Yep. Yeah, it's even more critical if you do anything associated with critical infrastructure too. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. No, Stuart, to your point though, on the on the vulnerability the vulnerability scan piece, I mean, this idea of compliance in today's world is changing into how often do you scan? You know, is it once a week? Is it once a month? But the continuous scanning piece to go full circle to our initial conversation on cyber insurance, just wait for that to be a requirement. I mean, it's it's going to eventually be a requirement. I mean, it's not going to be. They don't want you to be compliant when you fill out the questionnaire. They want you to be compliant 24/7 all the time. Uh, and those vulnerability scans, I guarantee, are going to be a part of that. So. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is really interesting how often, uh, you know, that has changed, right? And if you look at SIS 18 and you look at NIST, you know, it's just gone from you had to do a vulnerability management scan till you had to have a vulnerability program to now you have to have vulnerability program management in order to be compliant with even you know a stage one data gathering on the NIST side or the beginnings of the SIS 18 side. You know, but just you know, I, I guess to be to be completely honest about this, you know, it's great to do these scans. It's great to do this continuous monitoring, right? But you have to fix this stuff. You know, once you once you scan and you identify vulnerabilities, then you know that's when rubber meets the road. And you got to like, okay, we have this list of all these things. How do we fix this stuff? And that's where I really think you know that's where like a CISA organization or an NCC organization um, can help with uh, with kind of some advice on where to go because again if you're that you're that one IT guy uh, or gal in an organization and you get a report that says okay here's all your vulnerabilities thank you have a nice day you know that doesn't do anybody any good right no absolutely well, look, we only have a couple of minutes. Um, why don't we do this? You know, we've we've got um, we've got these sessions coming up. Um, if you're interested in attending either one of those, um, you know, please register. We also have this session coming up on uh, it's August 18th um, with uh, these folks talking about zero trust and uh, and where zero trust is going and some of the things the National Cybersecurity Center is doing uh, in that particular area, both for large businesses and for small businesses. Um, why don't we do this, you know, Forrest, why don't I hand it to you for a second? If you've got a minute or so, you a couple of closing comments you want to make, and then Mark will let you wrap it up and uh, we'll end at the top of the hour and uh, give everybody the rest of their time back. Sure. Yeah. No, and Stuart, I got to say, thanks again for having us here. I mean, this has been a great conversation and um, it's great to see the work that you and your company are doing. So, so thanks, Kim, for having us. This is awesome. And the only final thing I would say is that, you know, in the very beginning, I mentioned that, you know, a lot of our goals and our objectives are on this idea of this methodology that we are a think and do tank. We want to see what's coming up in the future. We want to act on those things. Um, this is an SMB audience. SMBs is a place where we, uh, a lot of our initial focus was really the workforce and kind of, you know, the SLTT, the state and locals, has been a, has been a vast majority of our work in the past two years, we've started to do more with SMBs, but um, anybody here in this audience, or even you, Stuart, if there are specific things that you think we can do to benefit the SMB community, um, please let us know. Um, you know, because those are always helpful for us, because what ends up happening for us is we throw it on a strategic plan, we start looking at fundraising, and you know, we start working with the federal government, state and local governments, and we start to make those things happen. That's that's really where the rubber hits the road for us, but we, we like to get that input from the community to understand that. So. Um, so Stuart, feel free to shoot me an email. People are willing to they can reach out to me and, and tell me directly if they'd like. But but that's I always appreciate the feedback because it really helps us to kind of guide where we're going. So well, the the, the website's up on the page uh, on the screen, I should say. And if anybody's got any uh, wants to get connected, uh, you know, please respond to the emails that we send out. We'll also send you the link to that paper um, as well. So uh, we'll continue to provide you you know more and more education as part of our thought leadership series. So Mark, any last thoughts? Um, I guess just to kind of 
um, add on to what Forrest said. We're a nonprofit. You know, we we can't make a profit. We can't. We don't have a big bankroll of of money that we're worried about um, annual revenue. That gives us a lot of flexibility because we're we are very responsive to um, to what uh, what the the community needs. So you know, we get companies come to us all the time to say, hey, we heard about this or we saw this. We'd like to get involved. Is there a way we can sponsor a program? You know, and we don't take all those. Sometimes, you know, it, it there may be a conflict of interest involved with that. But I just say, you know, we're a nonprofit. We're here to support the small and medium-sized business community. And, you know, if you have a, a question or a concern or an idea, you know, call us, call Force. You know, Force is our, is is in charge of all operational stuff, and and he's got his fingers on so many things I can't even keep track of it all. But um, but you know, we're here to help. Well, uh, thank you both very much. You know, we really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Um, we will continue next week with our uh, launch and learn with Gradient for MSPs and MSSPs that are looking to enhance their billing systems. Uh, and with uh, the way we're integrating with our API. I want to thank everybody for attending. You know, continue to connect on LinkedIn, continue to uh, collaborate and have the conversations amongst your peers. We're happy to facilitate that whenever we can. And uh, as I said, our advisory council asked us a year ago to put these sessions together. We've been running about two a month and uh, we appreciate everybody's time and we hope we've given you a few things to think about that can help your organization be a little bit stronger and a little bit safer going forward. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your time today and we'll see you on the next session. Mark and Forrest, thanks so much for your time. Thanks, Jordan.